everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm John Goldberg. For those who don't know me, I'm the interim dean. Um, and I am delighted to welcome you uh, as we gather to celebrate uh, Elizabeth Pop Kamali on the occasion of her appointment as the Austin Wakeman Scott Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. It's wonderful that uh, so many of you could be here, colleagues, students, friends, and guests on this happy occasion. In particular, uh, please join me in uh, extending a warm welcome to uh, Professor Kamali's spouse, Masood, uh, and to their children, uh, Aiden and Anahita. Uh, before we proceed uh, uh, to hear from Professor Maka uh, Kamali, I'd like to share uh, a little bit about the Scott Professorship and its history. Uh, the Austin Wakeman Scott Chair was established in 1973 to honor the life and legacy of its namesake, the renowned Harvard Law School professor. Professor Scott was a member of this faculty for an astonishing 52 years. He began teaching in 1909, six years after the Wright brothers' first powered flight, and concluded his service as a tenured professor in 1961, one year before John Glenn orbited the Earth. On top of this, Professor Scott remained active in mentoring and scholarship for another 20 years. It is a measure of his standing that when, in anticipation of his 90th birthday, Dean Albert Sachs launched a fundraising campaign for a chair in his honor. It took only two years to endow the chair, thanks to contributions from more than 2,000 friends, alumni, and colleagues. This was the only, only the third time in the school's history that a living faculty member has been so honored. Austin Scott was known especially for his contribution to the law of trusts. His five-volume treatise on the subject, first published in 1939, was known simply as Scott on Trusts. When the second edition was published in 1956, it earned him Harvard University's highest faculty recognition, the George Ledley Prize. In the words of Dean Derek Bach, who was a student of Scott's and who would later, of course, become president of Harvard, quote, we saw in Professor Scott all that was awesome and majestic about the Harvard Law School. He did not simply teach trusts, he was trusts in the sense of being responsible for almost the entire universe of material to which we referred, unquote. Looking back over his career, Professor Scott once explained his passion for his job in the following terms, quote, I have enjoyed doing what I have done more than anything else I might have done. You can say of me, as Chaucer said of his clerk of Oxenford, and gladly would he learn and gladly teach, unquote. Scott's invocation of Chaucer was prescient. As Chaucer portrayed him, the clerk of Oxenford, someone whom today we would call an Oxford University professor, was a scholar scholar. And of course, Chaucer himself was a leading light in the world of medieval English thought. Chaucer's world was one in which law, religion, and literature interacted intricately and intensively. Thus, as an object of study today, it prevents a profound challenge for legal historians. Note the segue. Not only do they have to struggle with cryptic and incomplete legal records, they must also grasp the culture of the period so as to be able to place these legal materials in context. The charge of the legal historian in, of this period, in short, is to understand and illuminate not only the plea rolls and not only the Canterbury Tales, but how they relate to one another. And it is our law school's great fortune to have as a member of our faculty, Elizabeth Pop Kamali, a scholar who stands almost alone in embodying this extraordinary combination of talents. Professor Kamali, or Liz as we know her, joined the faculty in 2015. She teaches and writes about criminal law and medieval English legal history, focusing especially on the transition from trial by ordeal to trial by jury, as well as on then prevailing understandings of guilt and culpability. Fittingly, the ties between her research interest and Harvard Law School go way back. She began her study of medieval law as an undergraduate at Harvard College when she worked with 14th century manor court roles from the law school's collection for her senior thesis. 
impressive. She earned an AB magna cum laude from the college, a JD magna cum laude from the law school, and a PhD from the University of Michigan, where she was awarded the Catherine T. Pryor Award for best paper by an early career scholar by the American Society for Legal History and the Medieval Academy of America Graduate Student Prize for best graduate student paper. She has written more than and published more than a dozen highly regarded articles and book chapters, and her work has appeared in leading legal and history journals. Her book, Felony and the Guilty Mind in Medieval England, uh, praised by reviewers as, quote, brilliant, masterful, and a tour de force, is an astonishingly rich and utterly engaging effort to reconstruct how jurors understood criminality in the 12 and 1300s. One hallmark of her scholarship is the way in which it gives color and life to practices and ideas long dead. Another is its knack for finding in other al otherwise alien circumstances very recognizable problems. For example, the ways in which medieval English law wrestled with the apparently eternal question of how drunkenness should affect legal responsibility. And I would be remiss if, it did not, if I did not point out that when you read Professor Kamali's work, you will find yourself smiling, if not laughing out loud at the sly humor she deftly brings to bear on some not so humorous topics. Professor Kamali, the historian, is also completely present in other ways. Not only is she a stellar and caring teacher of criminal law and many other courses, she is also a model institutional citizen, as a dean must acknowledge. A member of Harvard's Standing Committee on Medieval Studies, she has also served on countless law school committees and has helped lead the development of our new writing center. On top of all this, she was for several years a deputy dean. I had the privilege of working with Liz, if I may, as her co-deputy, and I can attest firsthand that she approaches administration with the same intelligence, humility, and wisdom, and the same welcome sense of humor that is evident in her scholarship. I apologize for going on, but it is hard not to. Let me sum up. Professor Kamali is a brilliant and innovative interdisciplinary researcher and scholar. She is a gifted and generous teacher and mentor to both to our students and to, to many students from across the university who flock to her classes. And she is a steadfast and wise friend, colleague, and partner to so many of us on the faculty on and beyond. Please join me in congratulating Elizabeth Pop Kamali, the Austin Wakeman Scott Professor of Law. It means so much to me to assume this particular chair, a chair named for someone whose experience here as a student at HLS left him feeling a lifelong debt of gratitude toward his alma mater. I can relate. I'm grateful almost beyond words. I say almost because I am about to give a very long lecture. <laughs> I'm grateful to my students, my faculty and staff colleagues, my three deans, Martha, John, and John. I could say so much more, but I won't. I'll save it for later. Uh, my many mentors, including Charlie Donahue, Tom Green, Janet Halley, uh, my mother who could not be here today but will watch the video, so hi, mom. <laughs> um, and my beloved family, uh, most of all, Anahita, Ideen and Masood. Um, thank you. I love you. So looking at old photos of Austin Wakeman Scott, Scotty, or Mr. Harvard Law School, as some affectionately called him, when he was still walking the hallways here in his 90s, I cannot help but feel a connection to generations past of Harvard Law students and faculty, and I'm grateful for that too. I'm also grateful for the previous holders of this chair, even those I did not have the pleasure of knowing. In St. Peter's Basilica, 
at the Vatican on Passion Sunday each year, several major relics are displayed for public viewing. Of these, the most famous is known colloquially as the Veronica. Reputedly, the simple linen cloth of a woman bearing that name who compassionately wiped the face of Jesus as he suffered on the road to his crucifixion. The cloth is said to portray the vera icona, or true image of Christ's face. Although Peter's tomb occupies the central altar space at St. Peter's Basilica under Bernini's famous baldachin, Pope Julius II placed the first marble stone for the new Renaissance Basilica, designed to replace its Constantinian and medieval forebear, at the site of what is now the Veronica Pillar. The Veronica is at the Vatican's heart, as it was at the heart of the itineraries of medieval pi pilgrims traveling to Rome and of the stories told of Christ's passion and its aftermath in medieval Europe. Though one will not find treatises like Bracton quoting the Veronica story, would that one could, my job would be a lot easier, I would like to argue today that the story's most prominent themes were also at the heart of the common law of felony itself in the 13th century when England, like its continental European neighbors, grappled with the question of how to manage proof of crime in a world without trial by ordeal. Like Veronica, grasping the upper corners of her veil to display the image printed thereon. Let me show you what I mean. In my work to date, I have explored a crucial period in the early development of the medieval English common law of felony, namely the transition from trial by ordeal to trial by jury in the early 13th century. Trial by ordeal, the Eudicium Dei, or judgment of God, involved subjecting the accused body to extreme stress and then pronouncing guilt or innocence based on the physical outcome. In trial by hot iron, for example, the accused would carry a hot iron for several paces. Three days later, their hand would be unbandaged, and they would be declared innocent if the hand were healing normally, guilty if the hand were festering. Ordeals involved solemn liturgies. At the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, the Catholic Church effectively prohibited the ordeal by pronouncing that priests might no longer administer it. Now what happened next is a topic that has long fascinated legal historians. The traditional narrative tells a story of divergent paths after 1215, and yes, again, due to a church council and not Magna Carta, although it is the same year. So after 1215, England adopted trial by jury while continental Europe adopted the inquisitorial procedures of the church courts. England left the ultimate question of guilt or innocence to a largely self-informing jury of neighbors expected to know something about what had transpired. The continent, by comparison, relied heavily on interrogation, the deposition of witnesses, confessions sometimes procured through torture, and strict rules for measuring proof leaving to judges the task of scrutinizing evidence and reaching a final verdict. So today I'd like to tell you about a storytelling tradition that was shared by England and continental Europe at the time of this great procedural transition. The story long predates the 13th century, having its roots in the fourth century tale of Abgar, king of Edessa, today in Turkey, receiving a healing letter from Jesus accompanied by an image of Jesus's face. Veronica enters the legend in early versions of the Cura Sanitatis Tiberii, literally the cure of Tiberius's health around the year 600, and the Vindicta Salvatoris, the vengeance of the savior circa 700, stories that tell of the aftermath of Jesus's death and resurrection. The Veronica story, it must be stated at the outset, is apocryphal. Nowhere in the Bible is mention made of a woman named Veronica, although some accounts 
associate her with the gospel episode of an unnamed woman cured of bleeding after touching Jesus's cloak. Despite its apocryphal nature, the Veronica story in its many, many versions persistently emphasizes issues of proof. My claim today is that the story's themes map neatly onto priorities evident in proving felony in 13th century England. The Veronica story is certainly not essential to understanding English felony law. It is in contemplation of the story, however, that I have found myself shuffling the lenses through which I view England's approach to proof in a post-ordeal world. So for those of you unfamiliar with Veronica, and I suspect maybe it's most of you, um, I'll share one version of her story. It's a version that appears in 13th and 14th century manuscripts in English, French, and Welsh archives. In this telling, Veronica provides a cure for the ailing Roman emperor, and also incidentally spurs the sentencing of Pilate to death for his role in the crucifixion of Christ. As the story unfolds, we learn that the emperor Tiberius, desperate for a cure and having heard of Jesus's miracles, decided to send a good baron named Volusian to Jerusalem to inquire about Jesus. Volusian is described intriguingly as a prouveur del temple, a title that seems to evoke priestly duties referencing a temple, yet also his role in conducting trials or bringing accusations of crime. Upon his arrival in Jerusalem over a year later, he reassured the Jewish high priest and Pilate that he did not intend to usurp control over Judea, but only wished to seek help for the ailing emperor. Specifically, he desired to see Jesus, who was reputed to cure the sick. Upon hearing this, Pilate became sad and moaned. Pilate had good cause to fret. He knew Jesus had died, and he knew he could be blamed for that fact. As he contemplated what to tell Volusian, one of Pilate's knights announced out of turn, this one, Volusian, wishes to see the very wise man, Jesus Christ, whom your highness did not hesitate to crucify. <laughs> Another knight then announced that Jesus had risen from the dead, a fact which a man named Joseph of Arimathea confirmed when interrogated by Volusian. Twelve men, likely the apostles, but also clearly suggestive of an inquest or jury, then testified, we saw Jesus ascend into the sky. Hearing all this testimony, Volusian in incarcerated Pilate in a strong jail. Next, he interrogated Pilate regarding his culpability in bringing about Jesus' death. Pilate, in turn, tried to deflect blame onto the Jews. And as may already be apparent, I'll just note, there's a strong current of anti-Semitism running through these texts. So the story finally turns to Veronica. I know I promised Veronica, and here's Veronica. So Volusian goes on to ask if anyone has an image of Jesus. And a man named Marcus, who knew the secret of a good woman, un bonne femme, informed Volusian that three years earlier, Jesus had healed a woman suffering from a flow of blood. For the love of Jesus, the woman had, paint, had his image painted on a cloth, just as if he were living again. Volusian had Veronica brought to him and explained that he wanted to see the image of Jesus, the true God who had restored the health of her body. Veronica initially declined, but Volusian persisted. Finally, Veronica, Veronica confessed that she had the image at home where she said she kept it beneath the head of her bed because she liked to have it close to her when she was sleeping. When Volusian saw the image, he vowed punishment on whoever had sent Jesus to be crucified. So a group of knights traveled to Rome with Pilate, Veronica, and the image, the journey taking them nine months. Tiberius was sick in bed when they arrived. Hearing what Volusian had learned on his travels, Tiberius asked him why he had not just killed Pilate. 
Eventually, Tiberius sentenced Pilate to exile in, wait for it, Tuscany. <laughs> Volusian then proceeded to tell Tiberius about Veronica. Tiberius addressed her, acknowledging that she had been worthy to see and touch the fringe of Jesus's clothing. Reverencing the image, Tiberius was healed. He commanded that the image be adorned with gold, silver, and precious stones. And the story's final turn revolves around Tiberius's campaign to promote baptism, including the use of torture to achieve that end. So as I said, this is one version of the Veronica story. There are so, so very many versions. It's almost as though because it's apocryphal, people felt like they could do whatever they wanted um, with it. Some accounts place Veronica on the path of Jesus' Jesus's walk to his crucifixion, and that's the version familiar to Catholics from the Stations of the Cross, which is a later Franciscan innovation. In that account, Veronica uses her cloth to wipe blood and sweat from Jesus' face, resulting in the imprinted image. The multiplication of Veronica stories in Latin and the vernacular in the 13th and 14th centuries is attributable, at least in part, to Pope Innocent III's special devotion to the image, which helped spur the Veronica's popularity among pilgrims venturing to see Rome's holy sites, as well as armchair pilgrims who might reverence an image of the Veronica from the comfort of home. It seems that a legend with a matter of proof at its core, proof of Jesus's human appearance and of his divinity, but also proof of the manner of Jesus's death and of the guilt of those who sentenced and executed him, was bound to capture the imagination of a pope known to history as a proponent of rational proof, whether judging candidacy for canonization or accusations of criminal behavior. So here's where innocent crosses paths with the Veronica. In early January 1216, a month or two after Lateran IV, Pope Innocent III led a procession from St. Peter's Basilica to the Hospital of Santo Spirito, less than half a mile away on the Tiber's banks. Now, some of you know that I was recently in Rome for a conference, and if you're wondering if I try to retrace the procession, of course, <laughs> of course. So the procession had been introduced by Innocent in 1208 to commem commemorate the wedding at Cana, one of three gospel accounts associated with the manifestation of Jesus's true nature. The liturgy accompanying the procession emphasized the works of mercy. In a letter to the brothers of the hospital in 1208, Innocent wrote that just as water became wine, so would works done through mercy and compassion become love likely a reference to the works of mercy carried out daily by the brothers. The hospital was Innocent's innovation, a charitable foundation built at his expense for the needs of the sick and poor on the public street beside the Tiber in front of the Basilica. Now, incidentally, this hospital, its merciful mission still intact, is in operation today. Um, and I took a couple of pictures outside the front of it. I promise this won't turn into a slideshow of my, of my recent travels, but there you go. Um, the hospital was charged in part with providing relief to pregnant women and mothers of young children in response to innocence distress over maternal neglect and even infanticide among the poor of Rome, sometimes by means of throwing an infant into the Tiber. The hospital also had an English connection. Having been founded on the site of the Scola Saxonum, which had served for centuries as a hostel for English pilgrims, and the Church of Santa Maria in Sassia, in which Wessex kings were buried, the new hospital attracted an annual donation of 100 marks from King John of England. So with this emphasis on the works of mercy, it perhaps comes as little surprise that the visual focal point of the annual procession was Veronica's veil. Normally housed at St. Peter's and only displayed on special days, the veil drew crowds to the annual procession. On this particular occasion in January 1216, a wonder occurred. 
described by the English chronicler Matthew of Paris as follows. While the fortunes of the English king were in a state of turmoil, Pope Innocent carried the image of the face of the Lord, which is called the Veronica, in procession from the Church of St. Peter to the Hospital of the Holy Spirit. This having been done, this effigy, while standing in its place, turned around upon itself and was reversed in such a way that the forehead was below and the beard above. Matthew tells us, that innocent immediately assigned great significance to the wonder, interpreting it as a foreboding prophecy and writing a new prayer to honor the Veronica in order that the Pope might be reconciled to God. Now, knowing that innocent would be dead by mid-July, just a few months later, we might attach some personal significance to the sense of foreboding the incident evoked did the Pope sense his earthly end was near? In any event, Matthew records that many committed the prayer to memory and even made pictures replicating the Veronica image to aid in their devotions. So here's the text of Innocent's prayer. He wrote, God who marked us with the light of your face, you chose to leave behind your image impressed on the sudarium, another word for the Veronica, at Veronica's insistence, through your passion and cross, grant that we might have the strength to adore and venerate the image now on earth through a mirror and in an enigma, so that we might see you coming as judge face to face who appears and reigns with God the Father. So viewing the Veronica, in other words, foreshadowed the ultimate post-mortem encounter with the face of God. The phrase per speculum et in enigmate um, references 1 Corinthians 13, 12, in which Paul writes, we see now through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. So why did Innocent find the Veronica story so compelling? And I might add, why has this particular legal historian found herself poring over 13th and 14th century accounts of Veronica's story in pre preparation for this lecture. So Innocent's historical fame is encapsulated in achievements, some laudable, some lamentable, of Lateran IV. A lawyer pope, Innocent arguably revolutionized legal procedure in ways that resonate to this day in civil and common law countries alike. Under his watch, the church removed its imprimatur from trial by ordeal and advocated a new procedure, trial by inquisition. Committed to the salvation of souls, he ushered in the requirement of annual confession to one's parish priest and new procedures for dealing with heresy. Innocent attempted to dispel confusion over the nature of the Eucharist by emphasizing the doctrine of transubstantiation, namely that the bread and wine became the actual body and blood of Christ at the moment of consecration. He insisted on rigorous investigation of candidates for sainthood, no longer permitting popular acclamation of new saints. Innocent's interest in matters of proof surfaced across many canons from the council, including provisions about keeping written records for trials and, um, sorry, and, and new sumptuary rules designed to make it possible to distinguish a Jew or a Saracen from a Christian in the hope of avoiding intermarriage. So proof, whether of a prior adjudication or a person's religious identity, was a preoccupation for innocent. So to bring this back to England, it bears noting that at the time of the Veronica's processional flip in January 1216, England was on the threshold of a transition between regimes from John, who died in um, amidst civil war in October 1216, to young Henry III, and between methods of proof in felony cases. Innocent, we know, experienced a decade of interpersonal turbulence with John, including a period during which the Pope placed England under, under interdict due to John's refusal to accept the Pope's choice of candidate for Archbishop of Canterbury. Innocent would, perhaps surprisingly, in light of that bad blood between them, 
um, Innocent would come to John's defense in 1215 when the king experienced remorse after affixing his seal to Magna Carta. In response to Innocent's various legal reforms, England adapted swiftly, abandoning trial by ordeal even before it had an alternative method of proof securely in place, adopting the new inquisitorial procedure in its ecclesiastical courts, and providing the first test case for Innocent's new approach to investigating putative saints. Now, I don't have time to go into the issue of saint making in great depth. You're welcome. Um, I will comment briefly on Innocent's first canonization Around 1200, the Gilbertine order, supported by King John and England's, England's bishops, petitioned the Pope for the recognition of the order's founder, Gilbert of Sempringham, as a saint. So the Pope ordered an investigation into Gilbert's life and miracles, and his instructions were sum summarized by the Archbishop of Canterbury as follows. Let us investigate the truth not only through testimony, but through witnesses, through popular fama, original documents, um, regarding virtue of character and virtue of signs, namely works and miracles. Gilbert was proclaimed a saint in January 1202 after investigators examined some 79 sworn witnesses, both religious and secular, men and women who had testified about Gilbert. And the same rigorous process would be applied in 1202 for the canonization of Wolfston, um, Bishop of Worcester. Um, the latter saint, Wolfston, was of such significance to King John that he requested burial in the Worcester church bearing the English saint's name. So with these new rigorous canonization procedures, only five saints were canonized during Innocent's papacy. Two of them were English. And England, similarly responded swiftly to the papal prohibition on trial by ordeal, despite the fact that it was the royal judiciary and not the church courts that was obliged to respond to the new mandate. In 1219, instructions were sent to England's royal justices on how to try felony cases given the doubt that had arisen since the Roman church prohibited the ordeal. Within a few years, England settled on jury trial as an ordeal replacement a new method of proof. But is that the full story? How exactly did one prove felony in 13th century England? Let's see what Veronica can tell us. So in the remainder of my lecture, I'd like to highlight themes about proof that appear in the Veronica story and that resonate with 13th century English felony procedure. And the lecture is based on a work in progress so I'll give just a bare introduction and I look forward to future conversations with any of you who might be interested um, as I continue to work on this project. So at the heart, at the heart, the very heart of the Veronica story is the efficacy of sight, particularly with regard to Veronica's eyewitness testimony. In Robert de Barone's version of the story, Veronica testified before Pilate and the Roman emperor's messengers as follows. I'll tell you, I happened to have made a linen cloth and I was carrying it to market when I met the people who were leading the prophet through the streets, his hands bound. He asked me to wipe the sweat that was running down his face. So I took one end of the cloth and wiped his face, and then I went on my way and the Jews led him on, flogging him. And when I got home, I looked at the cloth and I found this image of his face. That's exactly how it happened. Now, other accounts of the Veronica present her as an eyewitness to Jesus's ministry. In some versions, Veronica herself painted Jesus's image, drawing upon her memory of his countenance. And later, of course, we know in some versions, gazing upon the cloth, the emperor Tiberius would be healed of his physical affliction, demonstrating the efficacy of faith combined with sight. Now, with this emphasis on sight, the Veronica story was part of a broader cultural trend. Western Christianity experienced a more intensely visual religious culture in the 13th century. The elevation of the Eucharist took on greater significance as the church solidified the doctrine of transubstantiation, 
seeing, it was hoped, would reinforce believing. English diocesan statutes provided instructions for the moment of elevation by the 1220s, telling parishioners that they ought to kneel, clasp hands, and venerate the Eucharist by gazing upon it when it was elevated. The 13th century was also a time in, in which relics and the Eucharist itself were housed in reliquaries and monstrances, sometimes with little glass windows, offering the faithful a salvific glimpse of the sublime. And it was an age in which pilgrims took up staff and scrip to pursue a firsthand encounter, sights, smells, sounds of holy spaces, returning home with metal badges, offering universally recognizable proof of their singular experience. Now, neither reliquaries nor pilgrimages were new, but they're nonetheless characteristic of 13th century piety and lived religious devotion. So as with religious experience, so it was with proof of felony. Or was it? So in England, we know, adopted jury trial after 1215. And we know from surviving records that trials were brief with no witness testimony or the like. Yet, of course, that's not the full sum of English felony procedure. An emphasis on visual evidence is clear when we broaden out from the moment of trial itself. To take perhaps the most obvious example, a person bringing a private accusation of felony was expected to testify to events they had witnessed by their own sight and hearing, and a failure to do so could get their case thrown out of court. In a 1223 Norfolk case, for example, Durandus de Granistona brought a charge of robbery against a man named Henry de Vere. Durandus had gone on pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela leaving behind his wife, three daughters, and 30 marks for their care. He alleged that during his absence, Henry had come by force and abducted Durandus's wife and carried off his goods. Upon his return from pilgrimage, he found Henry seized of his wife. Here he's using a property analogy for what modern law might have recently called alienation of affection. Henry denied the accusation Ultimately, the court dismissed the case because Durandus had failed to speak of his own sight or hearing, non loquitur de auditu vel de visu. He had been abroad, after all, when the alleged events occurred. I think it's a preference for firsthand testimony that also helps explain England's reliance on confessions whenever they were obtainable, and its reluctance to allow defendants assistance of counsel. In the Placita Corone, a 13th century procedural treatise, an alleged horse thief asked the judge if he might have the assistance of a learned person who might aid his defense, to which the judge responds, what you? That course would be clearly against the law of the land and against right, for who can tell us more about your doings than you yourself? So keep God before your eyes and tell us the truth of this matter, and we shall be as merciful as we can according to the law. So Hugh confessed, and according to the law, he was hanged for his <laughs> crime. So while a confession like this leading straight to the gallows was fairly unusual, Accused felons routinely confessed in order to abjure the realm, to turn king's evidence, and even to raise a claim of self-defense. In general, eyewitness testimony and visual evidence were crucial in the investigation of possible felonies. When a corpse was discovered under suspicious circumstances, the coroner was summoned and would in turn require any potential eyewitnesses to appear at an inquest so that he might interrogate them as to their knowledge of the events. Neighbors and the first finder of the body would also be called upon to participate. Even when a death appeared to have been accidental, the coroner had to go at once to view the body and to inquire carefully of the local villagers in order to determine whether it was a case of felony or misadventure. So thus, while there may not have been witness testimony at trial, witnesses and visual evidence were key to pretrial procedure. And this relates to a second aspect of proof in the Veronica story. Namely, the Veronica story places emphasis on proof 
by touch, a theme that also appears in accounts of the doubting apostle Thomas, who refused to believe that Jesus had been resurrected until he could place his hand in Jesus's wounded side. As mentioned earlier, Veronica is often conflated with the bleeding woman healed by Jesus. The woman was healed due to her faith, faith which was tested and proven by the efficacy of her touch. Many accounts of the Veronica story describe the image itself being created through touch as Jesus pressed his face onto the linen cloth. And finally, the physicality of Jesus' suffering is often emphasized in depictions of the holy face wounded and bloodied. So take a look, for example, at this alternative image of the holy face produced by the master of St. Veronica, emphasizing the crown of thorns and the suffering and bleeding Christ. A little less sanctity, a little more CSI. So in felony law, Touch was a crucial source of evidence. The coroner's examination of a body might confirm an accidental death or reveal the possibility of foul play. Bracton instructs, let the bodies of those deceased, no matter how they died, be viewed naked and uncovered in order to ascertain whether it's felony or misadventure, as may be inferred from external signs as where open wounds are found or bruises which have not broken the skin as where they have been strangled, which may be inferred from the mark of the impress of the rope around the neck. Such visible and palpable external signs were also crucial to a coroner's investigation of a claim of wounding or maiming short of homicide. So in such cases, the coroner was obliged to view the said wounds, measure their length and depth, ascertain in what part of the body they are, whether on the head or elsewhere, and by what weapons they were inflicted. If the wound appeared to be a dangerous one and the accused person were present, he was to be arrested at once and kept in custody while the fate of the wounded person became known. And I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but it's too cool not to, to share. Um, in England, a prescription for healing wounds involved writing Veronica's name on the forehead of the, the person who was bleeding. Touch also factored into post-trial procedure in some circumstances. So when a woman was sentenced to death, she might postpone her execution if she could prove that she was pregnant. A jury of matrons would be called upon to palpate her body, employing their knowledge of the female physique to determine the veracity of her claim. It may not be coincidental that in some versions of the Veronica story, she is described as a bonne femme, a label that seems evocative of the bon homme, the good men, um, used to describe men worthy to serve as jurors. While women's role as jurors was limited to the testing of pregnancy, women were central to felony prosecutions in general. So let's see if I can relate this to the Veronica story. I can. <laughs> so in the cura sanitatis, Veronica, having been healed by, by Jesus, felt great affection toward Christ. And out of love for him, she acquired his image and she stored it beneath the head of her bed. In the golden legend, Veronica's faith in and affection towards Jesus bolsters her credibility as a witness to Jesus's ministry and death all the more so when she echoes the words of the apostle Thomas, my Lord and my God, minus the preceding doubt, before pointing an accusatory finger at Pilate, who, Veronica states, through envy, condemned Jesus and commanded that he be crucified. Now we tend to think of proof as based upon clear-headed reason and factual evidence, but in the Veronica story, Emotion is an unmistakable factor in building a character's credibility and effectiveness as a witness or accuser. When Veronica shared her eyewitness testimony, Volusian not only credited her account, but was moved to vengeance, promising to punish those who had crucified Christ. Now, in medieval English felony law, one will not find overt concessions to emotion in, in testing credibility. 
This doesn't mean, of course, that emotion did not play a role. So one peculiarity in the English system of felony prosecution is the surprisingly large role women played, particularly widows. Daniel Klarman observes that women brought nearly two thirds of homicide private prosecutions. Moreover, women prosecuted these cases themselves, repeating their accusation before multiple courts over several years without the advantage of legal counsel. Klarman rightly notes that women's ineligibility for trial by battle probably made them attractive candidates for initiating private prosecutions. But I would like to suggest an additional factor, namely that the emotional power of a widow's appeal might have made them compelling prosecutors. This may also help explain Klarman's finding that cases initiated by women were more likely to end in settlement than cases brought by men. Perhaps fear of conviction at trial or pity for widows or something else motivated such defendants to settle. Now, when a woman or when a widow brought an accusation of felonious homicide, not only was she required to speak of her own sight and hearing like any other person bringing a private prosecution, but according to Bracton, her husband ought to have been slain in her arms. Now, this requirement seems to have become a fiction, um, as did many other constraints on appeals by women but it nonetheless communicated an expectation of a pieta-like moment underpinning a claim of felonious homicide. So speaking of the pieta, in the 14th century complaint of Our Lady, Mary inhabits the role of prosecution witness, providing detailed testimony, it goes on for pages and pages, about the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion, including the physical assault upon her son's body. Her complaint seems designed to spur vengeance, much like the common goading technique or bloody token ceremony that Bill Miller has identified in medieval Icelandic sagas, where a widow might, for example, wave her deceased husband's bloody cloak to spur his kin to take vengeance. A similar bloody token ceremony may be found in some accounts of the Veronica, such as that found in the Wakefield plays, which replaced the figure of Veronica with Mary Magdalene. Commanded by a torturer to take her cloth and go home, Mary retorted, this thing shall call vengeance on you. So I guess my question here is whether a widow's accusation of felony in 13th or 14th century England against her husband's killer was that a legal form of the bloody token ritual? Other bloody tokens abound in later visual depictions of the Veronica, as narrators increasingly place Veronica squarely at the site of Jesus' passion, thereby making her an eyewitness. Her veil itself becomes a piece of evidence to be logged by those recounting precisely how Jesus' death had come about. And this reflected a broader trend or a broader interest in tangible evidence of Jesus's time on earth, as exemplified by this excerpt from Matthew of Paris's Chronicle for the year 1249, which reports that the Dominicans brought to England a marble footprint left behind by Jesus at the time of his ascension into heaven. Relating the footcast to the Veronica, Matthew observed, in the same way also, Christ is said to have made the impression of his face, which he is reported to have done for St. Veronica. Now, not coincidentally, visual depictions of the Veronica were increasingly accompanied by what would come to be known as the Arma Christi, a reference to the weapons used in tormenting Christ, Christ but also other tangible objects that were key to the story of his death and resurrection, from the cock that crowed when Peter denied him to the lance which pierced Jesus' side. And the image on the left is not at all related to England, and it's a little bit late, but um, it's in the Harvard Museum, so I couldn't help but resist including that one. Um, the English one is a little grotty. Um, so English 
felony law context, we find a similar emphasis on pretrial discovery of material evidence, such as the treatise Bracton's advice that presumptions might be drawn regarding where a man had been slain by following the tracks of a cart, the hoof marks of horses, the footprints of men. Coroners also routinely recorded the weapons used in the perpetration of an alleged felony. The coroner's rolls surviving from 13th and 14th century Bedfordshire specify the use of arrows, augers, axes, belts, bows, bows, forks, hammers, knives, lances, rods, sickle scythes, spades, staffs, stones, and swords, and other things. Um, the precise identification of the particular kinds of weapons could help connect a weapon to a suspect and could also be mitigating. You know, if it's a fishmonger's knife that he would routinely carry on him, it might seem a little less suspicious than the you know, pickaxe that you wouldn't normally carry to the pub on a Friday evening. <laughs> Weapons were not always viewed directly in order to be identified. So for example, in late August 1266, when Agnes Colburn went searching for her son Henry, who had gone out drinking the night before and never returned home, she found his mutilated body and raised the hue. The resulting coroner's inquest reported that Henry had seven wounds about the heart and in the stomach, apparently made with a knife, four in the head, apparently made with a pickaxe, and, and other wounds in, in the throat, on the chin, and in the head to the brain. So it would seem that the examination of the wounds enabled the inquest to identify the types of weapons that had been employed. In other instances, it's fairly clear from the coroner's record that an eyewitness to an alleged felony testified as to the nature of the weapon. So for example, when Aubrey of Hookwood came before the county court in 1271 to accuse Walter Smod of killing her son a week earlier, she testified specifically that Walter had approached her and her son on the road and had assaulted them quote, with a spart ax of which the handle was of hazel and the blade of iron and steel. And Aubrey went on to persevere with her testimony at four sessions of the county court, eventually having Walter um, outlawed. So related to all this is proof by inquest. And here I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, while the core of Veronica's story is one of a woman acquiring an image of the face of Christ, the elaboration of the story quickly turns to investigations into Christ's crucifixion, with the Roman emperor sending his representative to interrogate witnesses and ascertain the truth. And I've explored in a recent article, which is why I will be brief, um, English felony procedure relied heavily on pretrial inquests. The idea that England, after 1215, left the issue of guilt or innocence to a self-informing jury is true, but focusing on that can obscure the role of coroners and sheriffs conducting inquests, during which they interrogated suspects, witnesses, and inquest jurors through a series of questions aimed at eliciting the, the essential facts of an incident. Because we find little evidence of judges interrogating witnesses, there's been a tendency to assume England had a decidedly non-inquisitorial approach to felony procedure. If we've broadened our lens, however, we find that coroners, constables, and sheriffs were engaged in pretrial investigation, not unlike Volusian interrogating Pilate, Veronica, and other witnesses to Jesus's trial and crucifixion. So where does this leave us? Um, I'm gonna take a drink of water and then offer three quick takeaways. So first, I want to emphasize that the English jury cannot be understood in isolation. Fact-finding preceded the jury's entrance onto the adjudicatory stage, and some cases never made it to a jury if the facts proved insufficient. In its emphasis on proof by sight and touch, material evidence, and the use of inquisitorial strategies, England shared jurisprudential priorities with continental Europe, just as they shared a common faith and a common reservoir of popular literature like the Veronica story. In fact, I would argue that these priorities were visible even during the period of trial by ordeal, as the ordeal also cannot be understood in isolation from pretrial fact-finding. Second, just as the Veronica story combined mercy, 
the gentle swabbing of Jesus's bloodied face with vengeance, so too did English felony law combine these two impulses. While we are Far from the blood feuds of the Icelandic sagas, there is perhaps something that can be described as vengeance seeking in the widow's felony prosecution for her husband's death and in the mother's description of the precise weapons used to kill her son. Do something, she seems to be telling the court. And yet, we have the mystery of medieval England's really high felony acquittal rate and its heavy reliance on sanctuary, abjuration from the realm, and benefit of clergy to ensure that relatively few people met their end at the gallows. Vengeance and mercy, one advancing as the other recedes. Is that not our story too, the story of the common law of crime in general? Third and finally, I want to observe that the stories we tell about the law sometimes begin in Apocrypha and acquire verisimilitude through ritual repetition and the periodic display of relics, some reminding us of the humanity of mythic figures, <laughs> others of the majesty of mythic texts. Modern pilgrims, set out for places like Runnymede, where King John affixed his seal to Magna Carta. Like the story of Veronica herself, the idea that the English common law of felony developed post-1215 on a singular trajectory distinct from continental Europe is at least partly apocryphal. The true story is more complicated and therefore, I hope, worth telling. Thank you. One final thing we must do. There's a surprise here. <laughs> You'll never guess what it is. Um, but would you like to do the honors? I didn't bring my eclipse glasses. <laughs> the earthquake, then the eclipse. There. You can interpret those signs for us. Will you join me? Yeah.